book of Joshua, back in our Father's Word, how precious this book is. You know, we have just had the wars are over for the time being, and the land allotments of the 12 tribes have been lotted out. And Reuben and uh, Gad and half of Manasseh, the tribes on the east side of Jordan, have gone back home, but on their way uh, across the Jordan, as they crossed, they made themselves an altar. And the children on the other side heard, well, they made them a altar, a, a altar and immediately thinking, they're going to worship other gods. Now, what you have to be careful of when your family is separated, communicate. If you don't communicate, there's going to be misunderstandings such as there was in this case. And as I said in the last lecture, there's only one thing worse than failing to communicate with your family, and that's failing to communicate with God. They didn't ask him. Uh, they're ready to go to war against the shock troops that helped them take their land because uh, half of Manasseh, Reuben and Gad had to leave their families and go and assist the other tribes take their land before they could even go back home to build that altar. So finally, they get sent over a high priest, Phinehas, which in the Hebrew tongue means brass mouth, and he had a good one. Uh, and he goes over and makes all sorts of accusations, even comparing them to old Achan, the troublemaker, who t t partook of the accursed thing. And I told him, all, all we wanted was a church of our own on this side of the river so that our children, as they're coming on, would know how to worship Almighty God. We're not going to break any laws of Moses, by our, our fathers, by offering sacrifices on that altar. We simply want to let our children know that that altar is a witness that we have God, that he is with us. And Phinehas was surprised and, and happy that he could go back across the river and report to the others, hey, they're, they're fine. They should have known it anyway. Before they got all ready for war, all upset, all it would have taken is a little bit of communication. <clears throat> That's the lesson your father wants you to grasp from this. So don't ever forget it. In your own family and on your own people, communicate. But most of all, communicate with our Father. Do not leave him out of the equation of your life, or you're, you're headed for trouble. So let's pick it up as if we may in chapter 22, and we pick it up with verse 33, where these things are about to be settled, and we read there, and the thing pleased the children of Israel. When they heard that it was just a church they had built, and the children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them in battle to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt, and half the tribe of Manasseh. It, it is a shame that it went that far. It truly is. You know, when brother's ready to war against brother, that's a very serious thing. And all it would have taken, little communication. Verse 34, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us and the Lord that uh, the Lord is God, that Yah is the supreme being. And of course, well, what does Ed mean in the Hebrew term? It means witness. It's our witness on this side of the river they had Shiloh at that time, and Shiloh is where the main church was, not at Bethel at this time, and that's where all the offering was done once each year and so forth. But um, here they at least on that side of the river had a place they could worship God, had a church, but they would go naturally on the feast days back to Shiloh. So everything was cool, and that's why, because they finally communicated. They finally sent ambassadors over, even if it was old Bra Brass Mouth, who instead of asking a question and finding out why they had, lectured them for, for a long time, scathing lecture, and um, putting them down, and then finding out there was nothing to it. If they had only communicated, 
You might say, well, uh, people are that. No, this was a high priest. This was a son of Eleazar, the highest priest uh, under the order of Aaron. In other words, er uh, Eleazar's two older brothers were killed by God himself because they messed around with strange fire lighting the altar off because they were lazy. God killed them. And Eleazar was chosen in their place. And, and so it is that that ministry was at fault also. That ministry was very much at fault. That instead of communicating, he was going to do the communicating. He was telling them. Uh, and they had done nothing wrong. So all the accusations were for naught. And, but here, it finally, it, peace has, has come. And how did it come? Through communication. And the fact that everyone was only wanting to please God. And the very altar itself named witness. A witness that God loved his children. God had given this land to them. It was their land. Chapter 23, verse 1. And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken with age. And, and so it was. A years go on by, and Joshua's getting on up there. Verse 2, And Joshua called for all Israel, and for their elders, and for their heads, and uh, for their judges, and for their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. Verse 3, And you have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. You know, I, I think this is the hardest thing for people to get into their head. Is, can, can, how hard is it for you to believe that God loves you and he will fight for you? If you are right with him, if you repent, if, if you follow him, if you study his word, if you stay in his word, if you're pleasing to him, he's going to fight for you. How can anyone stand against you? They can't. You're, you're going to have the victory. So this, this is a very difficult thing for people to communicate within to themselves. Is that God really, as big as he is, he still has time for me. But why, why do you think he created you anyway with your DNA is different than anyone else's? Your fingerprints are even different than anyone else's. You're unique. Why do you think he would go to the trouble of creating someone like you if he didn't love them? He wanted someone like you. So uh, the Lord does these great things. Because of you, you're his children, and he loves you. As long as his children look to him, he will always take care of them. Now, there is a time coming in this great book of Joshua where he's going to say, I've cleansed the sanctuary for the last time. After this, you're on your own. I've given you power to do it. <clears throat> and if you're not hoarse enough to do it yourself, you're going to have to wait until a certain period of time, and then I'll cleanse it again for final. It'll be the final cleansing. That is going to happen. But always, this is why communicating with lack of communication with God is such a serious thing. Because he's your father, and he loves you, and he's there to help you, to always give you the victory. Verse 4. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even into the great sea westward. And, of course, the westward was what? To the Mediterranean Sea today. They called it the great sea then, but it would be changed to the Mediterranean today. He said, it, it, it's yours. And by lot, and we saw the map yesterday of the divided lot, how it was divided up, and, and so it was. Verse 5, And the Lord your God, um, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight, 
and you shall possess their land as the Lord your God has promised unto you. That's a promise of God. God does not break his promises as long as you don't break yours. He will keep them. He will always keep his promises. This is why that Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26 is so very important. It's where God talks to you. He says, hey, remind me of my promises. Let's talk about them so I can justify you. Being translated properly, it means, hey, remind me of the promises I've made. God hadn't forgotten them. He wants to know if you've read them. He said, you, you tell me about it. Remind me of them, and I can make it right with you. So uh, a lot of people want blessings, but they have no idea what God's promises are. This happens to be one of those promises. It, in this day and time, that's a very important promise that he takes care of our enemies for us when you are truly with him. And, and uh, well, what does that mean? He's going to do it all for us? No, he gives us the power, the skill, the might to do it and with his help. Verse 6, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, uh, that you may that you turn not aside therefrom to the to the uh, right hand or to the left, uh, that uh, you have the best of abilities to get it done and get it done right. So that, that's why you know. Um, it hurts me a little bit when someone writes me a letter and I can see fear written all over it about the coming of the Antichrist. Be of good courage. God's not going to leave you alone, and we have power over him anyway in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a coward dies a thousand deaths. A brave man only dies once. Now, so in these end times especially, be courageous. God is with you, God will protect you, and um, you don't have to worry about the right hand or the left, you hit it straight on as wisdom and, and uh, God's word that gives you the ability to, to the best of your ability to cut it, to get it done. God has can-do type people. Be courageous, verse seven, that you come not among these nations, these that remain among you, Neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. In other words, don't you take any of their characteristics onto yourself. Now, bear in mind, pretty soon he's going to tell us down in the 11th, 12th verse and on, that I'm, I'm giving you this advice, but I'm not going to cleanse it anymore. And what have our people done? Well, a little old example you've often heard me use is the word Ishtar. That's a pagan name, Ishtar. And it has slipped itself into our manuscripts in the book of Acts as Easter when Christ is our Passover. His death and resurrection Christ, as it's written in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, 1 Corinthians, rather, 5, 6 and 7, he became our Passover. Well, what is this Ishtar then? Ishtar was a fertility rite of rolling eggs of fertility out in the wood worship. It was a sexual orgy every spring that was absorbed into God's Word. And, and here you see the little children carrying their little baskets of fertility eggs around, and people think it's symbolic of Christ. Where, where do you find that written? It isn't. It is false teaching brought into the church because people don't pay attention to the letter God has sent us. Uh, is that some great sin? Well, I certainly wouldn't want any part of it. Why, why would you want some fertility uh, sexual orgy practiced by the church itself? Quick like a bunny. Well, that's the Easter rabbit. Easter rabbit. Okay. So, you know, you need to shuck all that stuff. 
And realize, as 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7 declares, Christ is our Passover. It's the high holy day of Christianity, not Ishtar. So you see, that in itself puts us in bad standing if you practice that with Almighty God. It, it embarrasses Him. It truly does, that you would not check. You know, you can take a, a Webster's Dictionary, a, a, a college edition, and look up the word Easter, and it will tell you it's Easter, a pagan holiday picked up as a Christian holiday. I mean, it's there for anyone to read. If you just take a little bit of time to check it out, otherwise, by the by the by the dozens they put on their flocks and their frills, and they fancy up and gusset themselves all up and march out with baskets and big hats, and Easter is on the prowl again. It's the high holy day of Christianity, Passover, when Christ died on that cross, washing away our sins bringing atonement and forgiveness to all people. And you parade? Well, I don't, and I don't think any Christian should. Be that as it may, that is the problem of many. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 8 and verse 8 would read, But cleave, what are you supposed to do? But cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done unto this day. If you want his blessings, you're going to do it his way. Uh, Joshua did it his way. Moses did it his way. Abraham did it his way. Jacob did it his way. And God always blessed his children. Verse 9, For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. As for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. And so it is. And so it has been. We always have the victory. Why? God is with us. That's, that, this is, that is no accident. Well, it's because we're such good troopers. It's because God is with us. Do you, do you remember the lesson, what was taught back in uh, this book of Joshua? When they got real lucky in taking several cities, Jericho, walls sunk down. I mean, they took that city like nobody's business. It was just it, because God gave it to them. And then they get together and say, let's do the same to Ai, which means a heap in the Hebrew tongue. And they take uh, a, a few thousand men and charge that hill, and they left it a lot quicker than they went. They all took the HA route right out of there, okay? I mean, they, were, they, they got thumped, and they got thumped good. What did they forget? To communicate with God. God didn't send them. They made their own mind up they were going to do this. So... You always want to pray and communicate with our Heavenly Father. Then you will always have the victory. It is the same way in the, the uh, spiritual community, that is to say, in worshiping God at the table of the Lord. Do it His way. Be pleasing to Him and be blessed. Otherwise, you're going to have a rough old time of it in this world because you're not going to have the blessings of God. What God is telling you, I do not want you to show weakness to your enemies. Anytime you apologize or show a weakness to your enemies, men are going to die. It's going to cost you dearly. Uh, you have to be of good courage. Let it be known you fear nothing. And that we are a nation a Christian nation to be feared if you cross us. Otherwise, we love you. That's your choice. Take it or leave it. Communicating with God, having the blessings of God. A nation sometimes can change and be apologetic and, and show weakness, and I guarantee you the enemy, it'll cost some men. It, it will cost some families. It truly will. But... God will always intervene because there are enough of God's election to stay with him and to follow him and to have things as they should be. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand, 
For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. There's another promise. Have you ever read this, the, the song of Moses, which all the overcomers are supposed to sing on their way to heaven? You can read of it in Revelation 15. They sing that song of Moses, and it says one can put to flight a thousand and two ten thousand. When God is with you, you have nothing to fear. So don't you ever show fear to the enemy when you're a servant of the living God. Because we have the victory. Be of good courage when you follow him. You know, our nation, parts of it may fall to the side, but as long as you, as an individual, serve God, talk to him, communicate with him, we will all, he will always protect you. He knows how to get it done. Verse 11, take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves. I like to translate that souls. Take good heed uh, to, uh, and, uh, to your soul. That's your eternal life. That you love the Lord your God. Oh, that is so very important. He does so much for us that how could you but help love him? Verse 12, else, here's a condition. Else, if you do in any wise go back, and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you, if you mix with them, verse 13, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. You're, you're going to lose this area. Just to say that where those ten, twelve tribes were given, it'll slip away from you. And certainly, um, as we know, it did. So it is today. If, if you let nations mock you, mock your flag, mock your people, and do nothing about it, then you're showing weakness. God does not approve of that. Now, uh, what God has said here is you know of a certainty that the Lord will no more drive them out. Why? He gives you power to do it in his name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have that power and that authority. But you've got to use it. When, then, is the next time that Christ, uh, you know, you can count on God's promises. I mean, they're, they're written, and that's exactly how it's going to be. When then is the next time that um, he will cleanse the sanctuary? It's kind of messed up right now. You got all kinds of people going here and claiming this and claiming that and claiming something else except for Yahweh, the living God. Even the very rock itself over which the dome sits, from the rocks from which Christ ascended. You have other things there. So when, when did he say that he would cleanse it? And you find it in, in the um, great book of Daniel in, in chapter 8, verse 13 and 14. You're not going to have it. I'm going to read it to you. He says, um, then, verse, reading from chapter 8, verse 13, the great book of Daniel, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, that's the place of offering, and the transgression of desolation, that's the desolator, Antichrist, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. That, this is going to happen. Verse 14, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then, and then only, then, shall the sanctuary be cleansed, vindicated. 
That's when it will happen. Now, what's 2,300 days? Well, in Daniel's time, you, you learn that 1.48 is one day in Daniel's time from knowing when the daily sacrifice was taken away. That is to say, the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, up till the time that this nation was established, it comes to our year of 1981, which puts you smack into the middle of the generation of the fig tree. That's when he'll cleanse it again, meaning you're living in that generation today in which it will be cleansed. Well, when will that take place? After the Antichrist stands there claiming to be God, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, the, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist, will stand in the holy place claiming to be God in Christ. And do you know something? Those unlearned, those toting little baskets will probably think he is Christ because he's supernatural. He performs miracles. As it's written in Revelation 13, following verse 11, uh, he looks like a lamb slain, looks like the lamb slain. That's Christ. Looks just like Christ. Got the horns, meaning he's got power. The voice that's coming out of him is the dragon, meaning it's Satan himself. So, snapping his fingers, lightning come down from heaven, boy, a lot of people are going to really be uh, swayed into thinking, well, indeed, this is the Savior. That's who he'll claim to be. That's why he's called instead of Christ, being properly translated in the Greek tongue. Instead of Jesus, he stands there misleading people and guiding people. Then at that time and that time only at the seventh trump will God, through the Son, cleanse the temple for the final time and the millennium will begin. There's a great deal written in this particular verse of Joshua. It so happens that this happened with a 110-year correction uh, as your companion Bible will help you work out, 14, the year of our Lord, B.C. 1434, up until the year of our Lord, 1981, in the middle of the generation of the fig tree. What a time to live. You know, many of the prophets wanted to live today when these events were transpiring. You are, and what a precious time to live. Verse 14, and behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing has failed thereof. Think about that a moment. Everything that's written, every promise that God has made, not one has failed. Man fails. Man falls short. Man let, allows himself to be deceived. Why? Because he does not study God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's Word he's studying rather than the, the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. What a power and what victory we have in Almighty God. When, how courageous you can be, all in all, knowing your soul has eternal life. And then even though the heathen may rage, that you have that safety and, and contentment. And Psalms 2 comes, the second Psalms comes to mind. Why do the heathen rage? And well, they do because they don't know our Father. We know Him, but we can rejoice because we know all this was promised. It's coming to pass exactly as it's written. Great book of Joel, the swarmers are swarming. That's the Arabs. All four stages of that locust army coming to pass. We're in the second and maybe even the third stage of the locust. It's happening in before your very eyes. And... Um, you can be so courageous. No, your father's on the throne, and not one thing that is written will fail. It's going to come to pass exactly as it's written. Verse 15, Therefore, 
it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, there's the promises again, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he hath destroyed you from off the good land which the Lord your God hath given you. That is to say, if you don't follow him. If you don't follow him, as he stated, you lose this land for a while. And certainly it was. Uh, God does not bring evil. Man brings evil upon himself. How? By not following God. By not following his plan. By not following his promises. Verse 16. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. If you don't do it by the line of God, then certainly you'll be gone. It would be, we know from Jeremiah 24 that Israel would become a nation again, and the house of Judah and the house of Israel have nothing to worry about in surviving. The only thing you have to worry about is if you don't follow the word of God. Because as he stated, and a child can understand it, as long as he will not, every word he has written will come to pass, every promise, just as it's written, it's yours. All you have to do is claim it and live it and understand it. And be of good courage. You hold that line against that that is evil and serve the living God. You'll always be blessed. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?